What's the big deal? I missed that because it didn't catch it. You want to repeat that? <laughs> What's the big deal? It's the word of God. What word? I don't know what word is. Somebody want to look in Psalms 136? Somebody want to look in 2 Chronicles? When Solomon inaugurated the temple, do you know what a festive occasion that was? For the first time in the history of the planet, the kingdom, having been given to David, had their own location in Jerusalem to construct the temple. Do you have any idea? Can you, can you imagine the thrill the glory. This was the pinnacle moment which has never been repeated. David didn't get to see it. Moshe didn't get to see it. Abraham didn't get to see it. And even the temple that existed in the days of Yeshua that Herod put together and the second temple that was put together previous to that paled in comparison. And those words Solomon could say nothing greater. Give thanks. But it's not just give thanks. Who do is praise, glory, splendor, reverberating, echoing. I can't expect Odu la yuwa ki ko ki leo la ka go to uh, echo much around these canyons. <coughs> But if you've got a million people shouting that phrase, it just might. In fact, it was supposed to echo around the world. In Psalms 136, you'll notice every other verse says, But if you don't know what those words mean, you're either quoting some foreign gibberish, or you'll just quoting the verses of a song, or you'll just find some place to say, yeah, that, that's pretty significant. Solomon stood right there in the front of the entire <coughs> congregation of Israel, realizing <coughs> that everything that Yahweh had ever promised, because at that moment they had kept His word, was suddenly manifest. The promise he gave to David, the promise he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to come back into the land after 430 years, to conquer the land, to subdue all their enemies, to take the kingdom, took it out of the house of Saul and gave it to the house of David. And he could say nothing more, nothing greater. He gives this big oratory recorded in Second Chronicles, and then Yahweh responds. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, seven things there, then I will hear from heaven and I'll hear your land. So how many Americans have to repent before Yahweh heals our land? Only those who fit the bill with these seven ways. It's not all the Americans. It's not all the Israelis. It's not the, the Jews. My people, called by my name. Who is that? Could be you. Could be me. There's a list of conditions there, and either the scripture is accurate with every word that he said meaning something, or else it's just, and so what, whatever, we're under the blood, everything's done. Yeah? You're going to say something? I'll let you continue my answer. I'm not going to 
argue about or discuss or even try to sway you as to how to pronounce the name one way or the other. But in Exodus 3.15, Moshe, who saw him directly as a man talks to his friend, asked a very specific question. That this was at the burning bush incident. And he said, who shall I say sent me? And the voice through the burning bush said, tell them that he has sent me. That's not the whole story. Three different things were said. He said, Ehie asher ehie. That's a whole teaching that we're not going to get into right now. Tell them Ehie sent you. That's a whole other thing that we're not going to get into. In verse 15, this particular translation, Elohim said, further to Moshe. So shall you say to the children of Israel, Yahuwah, the Elohim of your forefathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, the Elohim of Yaakov, has dispatched me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my remembrance from generation to generation. Does that mean anything or does it mean nothing? Does it matter? I've heard people say, yeah, he has many names. When Yeshua was asked, what's the greatest commandment? We discussed this the other day. The first word he said was, Shema. And we discussed that for over an hour. Just that one word, Shema. It's not just hear, it's not just listen, but it's take heed, pay attention, comprehend it, believe it, incorporate it into your innermost being, and respond accordingly. That's what Shema means. Shema what? The next word in Paleo-Hebrew is this. Four letters. Now, we could go through and analyze this one verse. Yahuwah Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Four words. Shema Israel. Yep. This word, they write it down. This is what he says. Shema, Shin Mem Ayin. Shema, Israel. And I'm writing this just so your eyes will see the words. So I don't expect you to read them, but I'm just saying. Shema, Israel, Yahweh, and then he says El Hanu. And then he mentions this word again. And then he says this word, Akkad. Now, if you look at the King James translation, I believe it says, The Lord our God is one Lord. But that's not what he said. Not only was he not speaking English, English just reconstructed the sentence. He did not say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He did not say that. That's a fabrication. When I say fabrication, you know a textile is a fabric? How is a fabric made? This thing is woven with that. A fabricator. You go to a welding shop, a fabricator is somebody who takes pieces and welds them together and attaches them and puts them together. It's what's called artifice. An artificer is one who uses art, skill, to construct and put things together. Hence, artificial compared to natural. The Lord our God is one Lord is artificial. It's constructed from phonics and meanings of words 
that simply didn't exist back in those days. Now, people say, look, I don't need to learn Hebrew. It's not a salvation issue. That's right, not a salvation issue. Anybody who doesn't want to hear this, you don't have to listen. Anybody wants to scoff, you're welcome to scoff. You're welcome to scoff. The reason I'm telling this particular tale is because when Yeshua was asked, what's the greatest and most important commandment? Well, what's a commandment? If you look through the list of instructions that this guy gave to Moshe, there's different categories. Instructions, commandments, statutes, ordinances, testimonies, appointed times, at least those six. I think there might be one more. Oh, judgments, mishpatim. Which one is translated law? Which one is translated commandment? Which one was done away with? Which one was nailed to the cross? All of them? Everything was nailed to the cross? What we were led to believe. Is that true? Think about this. If, if everything that was before the crucifixion is Old Testament, then everything Yeshua ever said during the four Gospels is Old Testament. So that when they nailed him to the cross, it was suddenly done away with. So that when he rose back from the dead, three days and three nights later, the first thing he should have said to his disciples is, pay no attention to anything I told you for those three and a half years. It was all done away with. In which case, why are we so holding of these first four books in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as being sacred? It was all done away with, nailed to the cross. That's what's taught. Though not so obviously, but rationally, logically, that's what's taught. What did he say? It's been changed. If you want to know what he really said, you have to look at Hebrew. If you look at the modern letters, you'll see something a little different, but we're not even going to get into the modern letters. We could do that if you want. But I want to try to give you an understanding of the value of looking at Hebrew. Regardless of how you pronounce this word. So think about this logically for a minute. If they ask him what's the most important, let's call it an instruction, if not a commandment. The most important construction is, he says, hey Israel, listen! Understand this. Pay attention. You really, you really, really need to hear this and take it to heart. Hear what? The format of sentence structure would tell us this guy, this is an identifier. But who is this guy? This word is a qualifier. This, these two letters at the back end, pronounced new and you, means our. It simply means our, O-U-R. Sometimes it could even mean we or us. So it's, it's referred to as a very specific people group. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, so now that now these people are not just everybody who doesn't want to humble themselves, but Yahweh is zeroing in on a very specific people group and saying, these guys hold the key of change. You want to change the world? It's not drinking a Coke and holding hands on a mountaintop. <laughs> Humble yourselves, pray, seek His face, repent, turn from your wicked ways. Change the world. You want to talk about spiritual warfare? What are the weapons? Sword of the Spirit. That sounds pretty poetically fancy, esoteric. What the heck does that mean? The Word. What Word? Do his words matter? What words? The whole Bible matters. Except it was nailed to the cross and done away with. So now which words matter? We're talking about the book of Hebrews. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. Which ones of those words matter? Or do they matter? Are they accurate? Is it a translation matter? You see, you were talking about earlier that we're missing a chadness cohesiveness, single-minded goal, destination, destiny. Why? Because there's 40,000 Protestant denominations, 
There's Catholicism, there's Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, at least now those three. And every one of them believes something different. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that every one of them have a different Elohim, a different God, a different deity, who requires of them different things, and who calls them different things, calls them two different things. And so, none of us are on the same page. Imagine that. The last words out of Moshe's mouth, which I started to say the other day, in, in Deuteronomy 34, Moshe said, Who is like you, Israel? Who's he talking to? He's not talking to the Christian church, sorry. He's not talking to rabbinical Judaism, sorry. He's talking to the confederated 12 tribes of Israel. Who is like you, Israel, who has such an Elohim to be in your midst to favor you beyond anything He created? There's another verse that Yahweh says, you want to build a house for me? Are you kidding me? Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. You want to build me a house? Gee, thanks. But then he goes on to say, it is to this that I look. This is the only thing that matters to me. A man who trembles at my word. That word tremble, if you look at it in the dictionary, has to do with anxiety? I thought we were supposed to come boldly before the throne of grace. <laughs> Let me offer a suggestion. If you don't regard his word, you ain't getting to his throne of grace. He says, kindness and truth, eminent chesed, precede his countenance. Which means he's not even present if there's not truth and kindness. Mishvat and Zadikah, this is in the book of Psalms. Chapter 89 somewhere, I think. The point is, Mishvat and Zadikah are the foundation of his throne. When his throne is present, Mishvat happens. Balancing of scales. Everything you did is going to come back on you. Everything they did is going to come back on them. You do Zadikah righteousness, you get Zadikah victory, deliverance, and salvation. You want him to show up? You got stuff on your side of the scales which uh, you don't want coming back at you? You better clean it up before he shows up. How do you clean it up? Emmet and Chesed, truth and kindness. Those four words I have found repeated throughout Scripture whenever Yahuwah himself, this guy right here, our Elohim, whenever he says anything about what's on his heart, what he wants for his people, it's Emmet and Chesed, truth and kindness. Mishpat and Zadikah, balanced scales of justice, doing righteousness. Doing righteousness in truth with a kind heart. And if we do that, then the balancing of scales means that what he then puts on the other side is the same stuff for us. Truth, kindness, and righteousness. And the word righteousness is the same exact word as victory, deliverance, and salvation. So, now either he was telling us the truth because it's the foundation of his throne... You do righteousness, you get victory, deliverance, and salvation. Or you can say, I don't have to do anything he said because it was nailed to the cross. All I have to do is plead the blood and then I get salvation. Excuse me, that's a different story. Who told you that? Moses went on to say, Who is like you, Israel, who has such an Elohim that he would even be in your presence with you, wanting to hang out with you, and then he tells you the truth about the way things work. Your enemies will try to deceive you. Next to me, no, Moses dies. Last words out of his mouth. Your, en your enemies will try to deceive you. I don't know about you, but my own experience in learning to read Hebrew is that I believe that the tool... You know, the weapon formed against you, no weapon formed against you will prevail. Isn't that what he said? The weapon that our enemies formed against us is the English translation of the Bible. Now, some people aren't going to like that. But I have seen in my personal experience that it has led me away from Yahweh Elohim. How can that be? Because Yahweh Himself orchestrated it to be so. Why? 
because he said, if you don't want the truth, I am going to send you, my people Israel, a very strong delusion, such that you won't even be able to tell what the truth is. Such that, as he quoted, as Eric quoted earlier, many, many people will say on that day, on their knees weeping, Lord, Lord, what are you saying? We prophesied in your name. We healed in your name. We cast out demons in your name. What do you mean? What do you mean you're going to throw us away? This is serious business. Listen, Israel. Listen to what? There's the message. This simply sets up this. This is simply translated one. Is that what it means? You really think this is all about monotheism? How many up there? Oh, maybe there's one. Maybe there's three million. Really? Is that all it is? It's counting? <coughs> we can look at the dictionary and it will say this not only means one, but unified. Unified? Well, gosh, we have 50 states that are unified. It's called the Union. So that means that maybe it's not one. How many? See, depending on how I translate that word, I can design an entire theology. I could design a whole new religion. And I can qualify it by Scripture with a translation. Really? He left us that loose? This is the one most important thing he said. What did he mean? What did he say? And what did he mean? There's a little mystery. Why did he say his name was spelled yod hey vav -Hey? In English, this letter could be the I. It became the letter J, or it's pronounced as the letter Y. This letter is the backwards letter E. The Greek flipped the Hebrew language around, the ancient language, and it's pronounced as the letter H. This letter, <coughs> excuse me, in English could be pronounced as either an O, a U, a V, or a W. And this letter is the same thing as that letter. So this is where they get the word J, the phonetic of an A, that's where you get Ja or Ya, Po or Va. Here's another Ah sound again. So regardless of how you pronounce those four letters, we're not even going to talk about that. Pronounce it however you want. What does that mean? The thing about Hebrew, every letter is a picture. Does he care? There's a whole other part of the study that we're not going to get in today. But you can look at it at the Erectology, a couple hundred different videos, a couple hundred hours of videos. You can look at it on YouTube for free. But the point is, there's a whole study about what these letters mean. Each letter is a word that means something in particular. This letter, Yod, is a hand, and actually that hand is a grabbing, a grabbing hand. Think of it like this, like a, a robotic arm. Some people draw it like this. This one is almost drawn like this, which became <clears throat> like that. 
this letter here is sometimes drawn like this, or sometimes like this, and it's where we get the word hey. It's to capture attention. And when that letter is used either standing alone by itself or as the first letter in front of a word, it simply means the. Which means it's pointing to something. It's expressing something. This letter here happens to be the sixth letter of the alphabet. In the book of Revelation it says something about the number of man being the number of the beast, 666, right? That's a translation which may not really say that. Other people talk about it. I'm not. I'm just going to reference <clears throat> Bob related to six related to man. But that letter itself really is a nail or a hook. It's something which attaches. What is it that attaches you to aiming your car in the right direction? Steering wheel? Could this be a steering wheel? What is it that attaches that side of the river to that side of the river? A bridge. Is a vav a bridge? No, tell you it's a nail. But is it a bridge? It's something which connects this to that. If I want to take my coat and hang it on the wall, oh gee, I'll, I'll stick a nail and bend it. Now it's a hook. Now I can hang my coat on the wall. It attaches my coat to the wall. I'm trying to show you that the pictures are not just a word of definition. It's a function. And the function may be a lot more than anything you've ever heard anybody tell you. But I'm trying to speak this way emphatically because there's something about that name. And if you don't want to mention it, the Jews have a law. If the wrong person mentions that name, you can be killed legally. Just so you know. So out of respect, they call them Ha-Shem. That word Ha meaning the, and the word Shem meaning name. I will not disparage the Jews for not saying this in phonetic expression. They don't want to mention it. They don't have to mention it. In Exodus 20, verse 24, I believe it is, right after the giving of the Ten Commandments, <coughs> this guy says, in fact, does somebody want to read it? Somebody have Exodus 20, 24? No? <clears throat> Getting the light here. Uh, no, that's okay. That'll put Blair on the board. Uh, verse 21. An altar of earth shall you make for me, and you shall slaughter upon it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your flock and your herd, Wherever I permit my name to be mentioned, there I shall come to you and bless you. Now, if somebody doesn't want to mention his name, they don't have to. But he said, now 